Turn that on. Good morning. Good morning. That's for the sake of the DVD. <laughs> Hosanna. Hosanna. There it is. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are we, for we have been created by that same God. Blessed is the sound of our voices lifted up in praise. Blessed are the hands that clap and strum and pluck, joining together in one glorious Hosanna. Blessed are the bodies that move and wave and march and dance in a tapestry of emotion, embodying your love. Blessed is the breath that enlivens us, animates us, and sustains us in singing our ceaseless praise to you, O God. Hosanna! Hosanna! Would you stand as you are able for our call to worship? Let all creation shout. Let us wave the palm branches high. Jesus is coming. He comes in humility to claim his own. May he claim us to stay and heal our hearts. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the blessed Son of God. Let us The Old Testament reading this morning is found in our hymnals, page 839. Uh, Psalm 118. We are going to sing response one wherever there's an R and then 839. The response is on the The Lord is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. There are joyous songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does veil does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. Thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us. We beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you and give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, who has given us light. Leave the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, who is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Praise Please join me in the unison prayer. Almighty God, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross. Grant that we may share in his obedience to your will and in your glorious victory of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Have any of you guys ever gotten something that wasn't what you thought it was going to be? You know, the other day I had an apple, and it was absolutely beautiful. It was shiny and it was shaped nicely, no bruises, and when I cut it open, do you know what I found? It was all rotten inside. There wasn't anything worth eating. It was an apple, but it, it was too old. It was yucky. Now, I had a, an aunt who used to do something kind of like that, because what you got at Christmas time, especially from her, was not what it ever looked like. She was one of those, and some of you may remember doing this. She would find a great big box and wrap your present in it. And when you opened it, do you know what was inside? What? Nothing. A smaller box, also wrapped. And inside that, there was a shoe box. 
nicely wrapped. And inside that, there was a cereal box, nicely wrapped. And inside that, there was a little jewelry box. And inside that, you found something that she had picked up at the Prattsburgh Flower Festival, which was really exciting. <laughs> it was certainly that little thing was not what this beautiful big package looked like. Something, sometimes things aren't what they look like to us. And it's kind of like what happened for the people who were with Jesus on the very first Palm Sunday. <laughs> yeah, Mary and Gary would appreciate that also. Their problem, right? The palms actually are this part of a larger palm. So what we get is a palm bud where these are all together and we cut up this part with only minor injuries, fortunately. <laughs> Bill Snyder, I intended to call you and see if you could cut them off, but instead I did in my knuckle, so. <laughs> he usually has some power equipment set up, him or Glenn, that they can zap them off. But they cut them off, and this is the part that we get. And it reminds us that as Jesus came into Jerusalem for his last Sunday, the people were so excited to see him, they grabbed branches off the trees and put them down so that he could walk on them, and they took their jackets and put down so that the donkey he was riding on could walk on this nice path. Kind of like today we do for famous people, we put out a red carpet, and that was kind of what the folks were doing then, was putting out a special carpet for Jesus to walk on. And so today, we have our palms but those folks that first Palm Sunday, as we know it now, they were expecting a king. They wanted someone to come in and defeat the Roman armies who were over them and took a lot of their money and their crops. But that wasn't what Jesus came for. He was after something more important. He wanted our very souls. Oh, oh. yeah. Just, just where is it? Right. Jesus wanted us to live with him forever and ever. That was the most important thing. And so Palm Sunday is the beginning of Jesus' last week here on earth. And so that's why we have our palms and we sing and wave them and we do all kinds of different things. I always thought Palm Sunday was about tickling the ear of the person in front of you, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Oh, she wants it. Look out, Cheyenne. <laughs> let, let us pray. Dear God, we know that on that Palm Sunday, you rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and people thought you were going to be the king. And in fact, you are our king. You are the king of forever, and you want us to be with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a good time in Sunday school. The gospel is found in Mark this morning, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, and it can be found in your pew Bibles on page 47. I need to breathe. Jesus enters Jerusalem as a king. Jesus and his followers were coming closer to Jerusalem. They came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives. There Jesus sent two of his followers. He said to them, Go to the town you see there. When you enter it, you will find a colt tied, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here to me. If anyone asks you why you are doing this, tell him, The master needs the colt. He will send it back soon. The followers went into the town. They found a colt tied in the street near the door of a house, and they untied it. Some people were standing there and asked, what are you doing? Why are you untying that colt? The followers answered the way Jesus told them to answer, and the people let them take the colt. The followers brought the colt to Jesus. They put their coats on the colt, and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their coats on the road. Others cut branches in the fields and spread the branches on the road. Some of the people were walking ahead of Jesus. Others were following him. All of them were shouting, Praise God! God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord! 
God bless the kingdom of our father David. That kingdom is coming. Praise to God in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. I find it kind of interesting that in this story, two of the disciples are set on to get the colt of the donkey. The suspicion is that those are the same two who just in the passage before our reading today were the ones to ask Jesus, can we sit on your left and your right when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus says, you haven't got a clue. (laughs) And now they are on donkey detail. (laughs) Kind of suspicious of the way that turns out. Those who wanted to be greatest learned they needed to be the servant. Um, So perhaps they learned that lesson after some time. We have made it to the last Sunday in Lent. Um, You didn't know next Sunday is Easter, right? Rosemary, you are aware we're all descending on you, right? (laughs) I still think it's wonderful that Easter falls on April Fools because the powers that be, whether they were earthly or, or the forces of evil, thought they had finally conquered Jesus. And on Easter, God says, April Fool, he's not dead. And so I think that's, that's somehow appropriate for that. I'm going to move this down just a tad. Are we still OK with that? Is that loud enough, clear enough? OK. Otherwise, my chain is rattling on it. And I don't like it when people rattle my chain. <laughs> or whatever. (laughs) This story of Jesus is the culmination of what he has done in his entire ministry. He has announced that he needs to go to Jerusalem. Not just that he needs to or wants to, but that he must go to Jerusalem. We know that the disciples We're not all in favor of this. This is not a good move. The religious folks there are not real happy with you. There's been many healings. Many evil spirits have been driven out. And it culminated with bringing Lazarus back from the dead. I don't know if any of you have seen a tomb open and someone walk out. I suspect not. (laughs) That's pretty impressive. Now, a lot of the healings and things, people thought, well, this is just magic. It is just a put-on thing. It is kind of like today we look at some of the televangelists who smack you on the forehead and everything is better. (laughs) But when you have someone who everyone knows is dead, and they have been dead long enough that you know they are really dead, and they walk out of the tomb, there's no denying that. And that kind of sealed Jesus' fate because all of a sudden, not only are the crowds gathering him, but they now recognize this is someone who not only can heal and say that your sins are forgiven, but he can give you life. And the religious leaders, well, they were kind of all of one mind. It was better that one should die than all of them suffer. Because you remember, the the climate that Jesus was coming into was pretty tenuous. The Romans certainly ruled the area, but pretty much they let the Jews go on and worship as they saw fit. It was kind of a, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone as long as you pay your taxes type of situation. And the religious leaders did not want an uprising, which is exactly what looked like was going to happen. Now, I always have pictured Palm Sunday as being a nice procession, people shouting, waving the branches, putting them down in front of the donkey. And yet, as I was reading more for this week, I came across some quotes that suggested it was probably one of the most daring things that Jesus had ever done. And in my mind, I just had not thought in that terms, so I'd like to share some of that with you. First of all, they're shouting Hosanna, which means save us, deliver us. Save us from what? Most of those folks along the pathway were thinking, 
save us from the Romans. And that wasn't Jesus' real intent. The other thing we need to picture in our minds to get this crowd accurate, the city of Jerusalem was home to about 60,000 people. During Passover, another four million people came to Jerusalem. 60,000 descended on by four million. This was a great time to make some money, which explains the whole money changers and all of that. Jesus picked the perfect time because this was when the temple was all about business and it was good for the business owners, it was good for the temple because they raked in a lot of money. And it was good for Rome because if you came with your offering, you passed through a gate and you paid Rome their portion as well. So everybody made out very well. But Jesus was there to remind them, that's not all this is about. The whole temple thing is not about raising money. You have forgotten the reason for the temple. And as Jesus came in from the east, which having visited, somehow it does not feel like east to me. It feels like west, but it's not when I look at a map. So obviously I'm wrong. <laughs> um, how many of you are good with north, south, east, west? You're, you always give, do you give directions that way and things? My, my dad used to be wonderful with that. I mowed the lawn on the north side of the house, and I'm like, okay, gotcha. But it would take me a minute to translate, kind of. But, and usually once I get it, I'm okay. But Jerusalem always felt turned around for some reason for me. But the prophecies were that the king would arrive from the east, and Jesus did. Now, he was staying just about a mile and a half outside of Jerusalem, and at the top of the hill overlooking Jerusalem, there is a, a fairly small chapel, church, of the palms, and they have a beautiful sculpture outside, which is in 3D and has the donkey and the people waving their palms, and it's like, it's almost solid carving on this side, and then as it moves to this side, the donkey's head comes right out of it. I'm not sure how that was made or what it was made of, but I was just fascinated with that, and unfortunately, I can't show you that picture. You got it, Ron? Oh, no, sorry. If I planned far enough ahead, we could have. However, that's another story. Partway down the hill, there's a, another very small chapel of tears, and that is where Jesus stopped and cried over Jerusalem. He looked at the city, and if you remember the phrase from some of the passages, he said, I have longed to gather you under my wings as children, but you would not have it. And he cried over the city. Perhaps he was the only one there that day who understood his real purpose and who understood what the next four and five days were going to bring. So let's think about if those folks thought they were going to be saved from Rome, from political oppression, what is it we want to be saved from today? We have lots of people in our world who would still like to be saved from political oppression. Some things don't change. For some of us, it, it might be our politics, it might be racism, it could be gender identity, it could be the environment, it could be how we deal with those who are in poverty. It could be uh, the various warring factions in our world today. Not that we have any frictions with our community or our nation or our households or our denomination. Yeah, we need to be saved from a lot of things, don't we? We often think that we're not the one that needs to change. Someone might have a problem with this but I don't. And suddenly you're put in the, an uncomfortable position and the realization hits, oh, it's me. I'm the one who needs to be adapted to this. Would we be comfortable in a situation with someone who's addicted to drugs? Would we be comfortable in the ghetto? I think of Jerusalem had its own ghetto because 
many people could not afford the taxes. So they would end up losing their homes. Often their families were sold into slavery. Sometimes they were even pressed into slavery in order to pay what Rome expected from them. It was not an easy time. And you think about that, and even you go to the temple and you know you're being cheated, but there's no way to get around it. When you take in an offering and one of the priests says, no, I'm sorry, there's a blemish on this lamb. You need to purchase another one from one of our certified dealers over here who will give me a kickback on what they sell, of course. You knew you were being oppressed, and yet there was not much you could do about it. So I wonder what the crowds sounded like that day. I picture them shouting Hosanna and waving the palm branches. But would you do that when you know that the Roman soldiers are all around? Rome knew that four million people come in. You can bet there were a lot of extra soldiers on duty. So was it a quiet thing? Was it a Hosanna, save us and lay something down? I don't know. But that's a whole different twist on what Palm Sunday might be. The author Charles Campbell notes that Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey was one of the wildest and most politically explosive acts of Jesus' ministry. Now that's not how I picture Palm Sunday. I don't think about that in those terms, I guess. But he went on to say that this was, in, a, in essence, Jesus kind of doing a lampoon on the political and religious leaders of the time. Um, and it must have been fairly effective because only four days later they have him arrested. So he must have ruffled a few feathers along the way here. Now Campbell points out, or kind of paints a picture, if you will, in your mind of what the cult of a donkey looks like and a grown man throwing some clothes over and hopping on, possibly his feet even dragging on the ground. It was not, we're going to put on our suit of armor and enter the city on our war horse type of thing. It was a whole different meaning shared by this. So he begins from the Mount of Olives, which is where people expected a king to enter Jerusalem from. But instead, he chooses to ride on a colt. Campbell imagines him sitting there on a pile of, of clothes that people have added, going down a fairly steep hillside, stopping to look over the city in the distance ahead, and then eventually crossing the Kidron Valley and entering into the temple area. Jesus came as a poor person. He was not dressed in royal clothes. And you think back, did Jesus ever hobnob with the social elite? I can't think of a time. Some of them approached him. But where did we find Jesus? With the prostitutes, with the sinners, with the tax collectors. All of these people that society would rather not deal with were the folks that Jesus spent time with. Now, I don't know about you. I will say for myself, I like our nice sanitized sanctuary with a, a group of nice people. And most of you are. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Name names? No. Um, actually, someone yesterday who was here for the funeral said, what a beautiful facility. And I said, yes, and it has a beautiful congregation as well. And we do. I said, my only problem here is I have to be careful what I wish for. Because if I say it out loud, someone will make it happen. And sometimes it's not prioritized. It's just off-the-cuff type of things that pop out which is a wonderful problem to have. But I think about Jesus hanging out with the less desirables of society. If someone were to come into our sanctuary and, and come around and sit here by Howard, and it really doesn't look the part, 
and really does not smell the part as it, it wafts through this side of the sanctuary, what would our reaction be? I hope it would be just as nice as if someone came in in a three-piece suit and sat down. But I don't know. It's kind of hard to be warm and welcoming to somebody as your nose curls, if you know what I mean. I always remember one of the bank tellers a few years ago. She asked me to wait in line until the fellow she'd been serving went out the front door. Then she crawled up on the counter with her Lysol and sprayed the area where he had been standing because he smelled so bad. I was like, whoa. <laughs> What's our reaction? Is do we see Jesus in that person? Can we see Jesus in the face of a blank, glazed look that we know there's drugs behind? Can we see Jesus in the person who's in jail? And we think rightfully so. Do we still see Jesus in that face that's in front of us? That's the challenge. And as Jesus was the only one who understood what was going on that day, that first Palm Sunday, do we still see him today? Now, being the body of Christ as we are today also requires us to be physically active and involved just as Jesus was. Jesus is Emmanuel. We only use that term usually at Christmas time. God with us. God in human form. But Easter time reminds us of how that truth bears itself out. It was at Christmas Christ came for this mission. And this week we see that happen. I title this, uh, the, don't miss the rest of the story, because it's very easy to go from Palm Sunday to Easter. We're used to Sunday to Sunday, but this week of all weeks has so much in the middle of it. Every one of our lives has highs and lows, and this week for Jesus was truly a roller coaster. It's the time of the Last Supper, and that wonderful gathering together and Jesus demonstrating for the disciples that I'm here to serve you as he washed their feet. And then suddenly as they're in the garden, he's arrested. He's put through a trial. He's beat. He is eventually hung on a cross. And everyone thinks, there, we've gotten rid of that. We can get back to normal. But three days later, it's Easter and Jesus says, uh-uh, there will never be normal again because now I have risen. And because I have risen, you too will rise. So do we see God in the neighbor whose dog is annoying us? Do we see God in the person who cut us off on the highway? Yes, we may use God's name, but that's not what I asked. <laughs> As we begin Holy Week, I would like you to remember to look for God in the people around you. It is especially important. This week we have more traditions and ritual in the church than perhaps other times of the year. I remember growing up, we always had the psalm read responsively, followed by the Gloria Patri, right? Yes. Today, it's kind of like, oh, we got to open the hymnal. Where is that again? Where, what are we doing here? What's a, Thanks, uh, what's a hymnal? There's a good question. And there's a word, that, another one that we only use in church. You don't ever find a hymnal elsewhere. It's a songbook or something, but yeah. We have our own little vocabulary sometimes. So this week, as we listen again to the story of Christ's passion, I urge you, as much as possible, 
to participate Thursday and Friday in the various events that are offered so that we can fully experience Christ's suffering and death so that we can appreciate the physical nature of what he went through because he went through that for us. You know, I said the high priest said, it is better for one to die than we should all suffer. He meant that as far as the Romans were concerned. We don't want to get them upset. But what he said was actually true because it was better that one suffer than all of us pay for our sins. Jesus took them all. And that's the point of this week. That's important for us, and then it's important for us to see Christ in others. So don't miss the rest of the story this week. Let's pray. Dear God, as we thank you for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, who is our Christ, help us to not gloss over the fate that he knew was coming and that he willingly took on for our sake. We praise you and we thank you for him. In the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. As we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, would you receive the benediction? The Lenten road has been long and you have seen much on this journey, but it is not time to quit. There is much yet to be done. Go in peace, you people of God. Go ready to proclaim with your lives that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Go to offer God's love and peace to all. Amen.